Hi, and welcome to Cooking by Heart. I'm Chris Sarandon. Uh, I'd like to also give a shout out to the folks who are listening, to the folks who are watching the stream, the live stream, and to this rowdy group here at the SHU Community Theater. All right, come on. In downtown Fairfield, Connecticut. So tonight, my special guest is Michael Tucker. Now, yeah, give it up for Michael, whose resume encompasses the world of acting, producing, writing, and of course, food. Those of you who know Michael know he's very much into food. Most of you know him from his years playing Stuart Markowitz on the long-running television series L.A. Law, but Michael's also worked extensively in the movies with directors Lena Vertmuller, Barry Levinson, Woody Allen, uh, among uh, many, uh, many others. He's also a, an accomplished playwright and had a very successful off-Broadway run of a play called Fern Hill, which was a wonderful play that I saw and was really, yeah, more, more applause, come on. And he's written several books, including Living in a Foreign Language and I Never Forget a Meal. Both in his writing and in his life, Mike's interest and skill in cooking is, well, folks, it's prodigious. And it's become deliciously and devotedly Italian. He and his actress wife, Jill Eikenberry, have a home in Italy where they produce a luscious virgin olive oil. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Tucker. Yeah. You, you, you didn't have to use the word lush just before I came <laughs> okay. Oh, Mike. Okay. Um, welcome. Welcome to the Sacred Heart University Community Theater. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to push the book. This is I Never Forget a Meal, which deals very much with how often events in our lives, important events in our lives, are related to food, which is a lot of what this show is about, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in, particularly in the subtitle of the book, An Indulgent Reminiscence. What's that mean to you? Well, I, I think, unfortunately, the more you indulge, the less you remember. So <laughs> right. That's a problem. Right. It, you know, I, I am an indulgent person. I, I enjoy pleasure, but, and uh, unapologetically. So. But this is not a negative. No, no. no I, a lot I think of people see the is, word. That's overindulgence. Yes, right. Yeah, I, th I don't believe in overindulgence, but where that line is, is negotiable. And you, you also talk a lot about, uh, in the book, about the, the, um, the relationship of, uh, interestingly, and sex and food. Yeah. Can you talk a little about that? Well, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're very much the same, except that you know, uh, uh, food takes a little longer to clean up, but um, <laughs> it's, it's all about, I think it's all about putting pleasure particles out into the space yeah. that you're in. Now, you can certainly do that in bed with your partner, um, and the, the pleasure particles are um, infectious. You know, if this person is feeling pleasure, her pleasure makes your pleasure better. And it's right. very much the same with food. When you cook a good meal and you stir it up and those particles particles right. float into the room, then yeah, yeah. suddenly you notice that there's a, a gleam in people's eye, there's a little color, more color in their face. Pleasure particles, yeah. Now, now uh, stating the obvious, uh, food and creativity are obviously a, a couple, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. particularly if you're very interested in food and you're a creative person. Mm -hmm. When you're at home alone, what's it like? Because I know very often when I'm at home alone, um, my wife is a filmmaker and uh, an amazing actress, and she just finished a movie in California. And uh, a lot of the time when I'm at home, I'll just go for the nearest thing. Mm -hmm. Right, if whatever the leftover is, I don't order in, but I'll, you know. I, but do you get creative? I do, I do. More I, or less? I, I sort of wait until Jill's car gets out of sight, <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I, I make um, for myself exactly what I want, and it, it's. That's the way to cook. And you don't That's have the to. way to cook. You know, the, and especially in our, our world today where this person doesn't eat, 
meat and this person doesn't eat fish yeah. and this person doesn't eat wheat. Yeah. Wheat, that killed me right there. <laughs> meat. And then, and then I, you know, so, so you go, okay, well, okay, I can do that, I can do that. So no meat, that's fine, I can do that. And no this, and okay, I can do that. And then somebody comes along and says, I can't eat red peppers. And you go, where, where did that come from? You can't eat red nightshade. peppers. Night, oh, nightshade. Oh, no, nightshade. Yeah, yeah. She had nightshade-itis and she couldn't, <laughs> she couldn't eat it. So when it's just me, I cook, I cook exactly what I want and I cook it without thinking because I'm cooking totally from desire. Right. So I want this. And I want a little more of that because I'm really feeling like that today. And mm -hmm. I want, you know. Now, you told me a story once about uh, an evening in Italy when Jill and a friend were on their way to some shishi restaurant. They, no, no, they were on their way to a vegan restaurant, oh. is what they were. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's a vacation for me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I made, yeah. Yeah, well, I. I had, uh, he, he's not with us anymore, but I had a wonderful friend who was a butcher in our, in our little tiny village that's near us. And I ran down to Ugo and, and bought uh, a, a nice uh, guanciale. Mm. Um, and there's nothing like an Italian guanciale, especially from, from Ugo. Explain guanciale. Guanciale is the cheek. It's, it's bacon from the cheek. So uh, uh, the cheek is guancia in right. Italian. The belly is pancha, pancetta. Pancetta, yeah. Guancia, guanciale. Fatty? Yes, a little fattier than pancetta. And what do you do with it? Well, you cook it and then you eat it. <laughs> no, I, okay. Come on, reveal some of your secrets. Well, it's a, you know, the, 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 the classic uh, guanciale recipes yeah. are, are the three or four famous Roman pastas, uh, which is uh, Amatri alla matriciana, you use guanciale, uh, alla grisha, which is alla matriciana without the tomato, carbonara, yeah. guanciale. And well, that, th those are the three famous. And ones. so the guanciale itself is the, is the basic fat of the, mm -hmm. of the what, uh, what I do, instead of using olive oil, yeah. you use the guanciale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I do is I, I cut it up, slice it up, uh, and throw it in a hot pan and just actually slowly, not too hot a pan, right. and then just slowly let it become bacon, you know. Right. Uh, and just when it gets perfect, I take the bacon out and put it on a plate. That is the meat part. The, the meat the part. The protein part, right. Yeah. And then throw some onions and garlic, sometimes just onions, into the pan and slowly saute them. And mm. I have some... Uh, wonderful, either Parmesan or, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, then to stop the cooking of the onions in the bacon fat, I'll put a little uh, water from the pasta pot. Mm -hmm. And then the pasta is about seven or eight minutes done. So about three, four minutes from being done, you throw all the pasta in the pan so that so the pasta the, absorbs right. the bacon fat the onion, right, and all that, oh. and then add the bake. I mean, add the add the, the cheese, the water, and they they there's a, a phrase. You have a, a fork, a big fork, mm -hmm. and you and they say battery, 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 and you beat it, you beat it, and that creams it up. There's no cream in mm -hmm. it, and then back in goes the guanciale, oh. and you're ready. To go. Are you guys ready to go out for dinner? <laughs> Now, uh, you, you and I have had this conversation about, because we both live in this area, uh -huh. uh, about finding a butcher uh, these days, yeah. which is not easy. It's really not easy. Yeah. Beef, is, um, beef is not good these days, really. I mean, there's, there's something going on with beef. And so what do you attribute this? What do you think? I don't know. It's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's not... You know, it, First beef, of all, beef is not highly... It, it's not chic. Yes, right, now. right, right. Um, because, because of cow farts, you know. Yes, methane. Yeah, yeah. so that gave beef a bad name, right? Right, there. feedlots. I mean, feedlots. anytime you say cow farts, it's going to give something a bad name. Right, especially food. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, uh, but I, can, I still love a good steak every now and then. Yeah, yeah but finding one. Yeah. But finding one, so I just don't have it until I can find one. It, it's interesting because also, isn't there a great meat market in Baltimore where you come from? 
Yes. Yeah, there's a great market, the or Lexington market. market. But yeah, there are butchers like there. Three square blocks of my indoor market. And it and, and was like that when I was a kid. And my, my dad worked downtown in a department store right near there, and he parked in the, the lot of the market. And so mm. we went through that market all the time. Um, and there were five or six great butchers there. Mm. Meat was better then. Yeah, I agree. It really was. That, and as you, you mentioned now that you're a kid... So let's get to the heart of what this podcast is about. Okay. Let's talk about when we were kids, all okay. right? <laughs> um, when you were a kid, did, did food, uh, did, it ha- did it have an attraction for you? Were you a creative? I, I was, I was. I, um, I, I thought that I had invented the grilled cheese sandwich. I found out later that that wasn't true. Mm. But, um, yeah, when I, again, when my folks went out, uh. Yeah. <laughs> right. I would the go cap, into the kitchen. The, right, the mouse will and play. I would get, so a little bit of uh, orange cheese and a little bit of yellow cheese. And I would butter both the inside and outside of the bread. And I would put various different cheeses in and then throw it into a pan with some mm-hmm. butter. Mm-hmm. Butter was big. Still is with yeah, me. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a big butter fan. And, and make grilled cheese sandwiches. Yeah. And my mom wasn't, my mom wasn't a great no. cook. No. No. Uh, so well, I, she worked, yes? She worked. She worked all day, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, um, it was self-preservation. You know, right. I mean, this was not unusual at that time. For a, that, I mean, there were working women and women who were at home. Yeah. The women who were at home were generally, not always, a little more creative yeah. in terms of cooking for the family. But mm-hmm. it, when women worked... It was another job. Yeah, you know, when, when they came home, they had another job. Right. And, and yeah. And so they resented it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and like, that, uh, it came out in the food. It's the same thing with sex. There we go again. Food and sex. <laughs> right. If you re- resent right. Uh, cooking, it's not going to be good cooking. Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, so there you are, home alone. Yes. <laughs> cooking away. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I, it, it just brings to mind a story you told me once about a meal that you made for a very well-known restaurateur. Yeah. Would you, would you mind okay. relating okay. that story because it has Jill, some... Jill and I had this little cabin. This was early, early in our days, but we managed to, to, to buy this little cabin up in uh, Ulster County, a little log cabin. And some friends of ours, uh, also people who live in Fairfield County and are still very close friends today, were coming over for dinner. Right. And uh, that was fine. It was going to be a relaxed dinner. Maybe I'd throw a pasta together. The day before, my friend Ron called me. He said, do you mind if we bring this other couple? He is uh, the hottest restaurateur, rest- restaurateur in New York right now. He has this fantastic restaurant on the east side. He's written a cookbook. He's a fantastic cook. And his wife handles the, the wine in the restaurant, and she'll bring a case of wine. Okay, for six people. So now I'm nervous. I've got, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I have to make something great, but I can't look like I'm trying to make something great. Right, and you I, don't want to. So, right. and so I go, I'm going through cookbooks, and Alice Waters has a good cookbook. Uh, she has many of them. And I found a recipe for marinated seafood grilled over char- a charcoal. Right. And it was marinated in butter and wine, and then you grill it over, on, you put it on skewers, lobsters, you know, um, uh, big, big, big shrimp, scampi. Mm-hmm. Langoustines. And, yeah. and uh, you know, it's wonderful. Yeah. Skewers. Marinated overnight. They show up, they have a case of wine, they're very nice people. We're drinking, we're thinking. I've got the, the grill out on this long porch uh, in front of the house. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, finally, somebody. How many hours me. later? Yeah, many hours later, Jill says, "Are you making dinner?" I said, "Oh yeah, yeah." <laughs> now by this time you've and been I, drinking for how long? Oh, uh, too long. And I go, I go out on, and and I get the seafood, and I go out on the porch, and the the coals. I have to sort of get the coals going again and add a few more coals and the sun is sinking fast and there's not there's no light out there you know so i I got a flashlight and i'm i'm cooking this this seafood 
And I, I put the, 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 the platter that I'm going to put it on on this post, you know, uh, on the railing of the thing. And, and <laughs> so I've got, I got the flashlight in my mouth and I'm, I'm slowly turning these skewers of this gorgeous seafood. Right. You know, and touching it and getting it just right. And, and as each one is perfect, I lift it and I put it on the platter, you know, that's up on the thing there. And I get to the last one, perfect, perfect, perfect. And I lift it up. <laughs> and there's no platter, there's no platter there. So, and I hear all this rocket la laughter, raucous laughter inside, and they're having a great old time. So. It's, there's nothing. There's nothing on the porch. There's nothing. And and I think, all right, wait, wait. And I go down, and it's like an eight-foot drop into this. It was like a. It was actually a, a cow meadow. It was not really a, a lawn or anything. So with the flashlight, I finally found found the platter because that was you know metal and I could find it but the the seafood had nestled down into the you know the scraggly <laughs> grass that was there and I had and I had very careful not to step on one you know <laughs> and I finally and I get it and I, I didn't I couldn't wash it off because it had this beautiful marinade on it. So, <laughs> so I'm I'm brushing it off bit by bit I'm doing the best I can with the flashlight and everything but I, I finally, I take it inside. I don't say anything. No. Yeah. And uh, I say, dinner's, dinner's on or whatever. And I put it down and they woofed it down like there was no tomorrow. This, oh, this is fantastic. You got another one of those? Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, and toward the end of it, the, the chef you know, looked at me and says, what's that herb? What's that herb? <laughs> Oh, well, well, re returning from the ridiculous to the sublime or vice versa. Or vice versa. That's yes, right. Uh, so your mom was not uh, uh, an enthusiastic cook. No. How did she, what, what she did she cook? She was an obligatory cook. Yeah, yeah. What did she, she make? Well, you know, you know, steak was good because we, we could eat steak from the, this great market. Right. So she cooked a good steak when we had that. That was at best you know, once every two weeks or something right. like that. She made uh, a spaghetti sauce, like a meat sauce, in a pressure cooker. A pressure cooker was big in those days. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember my mom. Every, every, cooking everything in the pressure cooker. Yeah. And that was okay. And then there was liver. <sighs> liver was not okay. No. And it, it took me 30 years, 35 years, to find out that liver is great. If you know, if yeah. if it's cooked rare yeah. and thin, with a little with butter onions. and a little onions on top, yeah, 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 heaven, it's, it's, it's like pate. It's, it's splendid. It's tender. Yeah, this liver that my mother cooked was like this shoe. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but th was she's there she's dead now, so I shouldn't say anything too bad. Well, uh, we probably have a lot more stories about my mother. So, but anything that she made that that you remember that was that you look forward to? No. <laughs> <laughs> crab, crab cakes, and Baltimore. Well, she did. She did make good crab oh, cakes. Oh, okay. I, th thank you for I, reminding I resuscitated me. And it. I still make her recipe for crab cakes to this day, oh. and it's a great recipe. Uh, and the secret is Wonder Bread. Ah, uh, not another bread. This chef who became that that other story was about. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, he tasted the crab cakes. And I made them for him once. And, and he said, you know, I could up this with, uh, I make bread. I, I make great French bread. And I could, you know. Use my and bread. I, and, and, and I said, no. No, it'll ruin it. Any bread that has any character. That's right. Or taste of its own. Right. Is going to ruin this crab cake. The secret of Wonder Bread is that it has no character whatsoever. Right. And you put, you, you, you make little cubes of it. And you put it into the. It's, it's crab meat and get good crab meat. Right. And then it's uh, mayonnaise and a little mustard, Worcestershire sauce, Old Bay seasoning, one egg per pound. Right. And then the Wonder Bread goes in and disappears. Disappears, right. And then the crab goes in and you fold it all together. So the, the crab cake, when it finally comes out, it seems as if there's nothing 
but lump crab meat in it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else. Very light. And it's held together by this wonder bread right. that disappears. Right. It's the binding agent, yep. in a way, the egg and the, and the bread. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, it's interesting to me, and one of the things that I keep going back to as I talk to people, and one of the things that I keep flashing on, and I think probably a lot of people feel the same way, are not just the tastes of the time, but the smells. And I remembered so vividly when I would go to the restaurant, my dad owned a restaurant, and we would go to the restaurant, to, uh, we would enter in the back, in the alley, and there was a chicken abattoir in the, in the alley. Mm. Uh, and so when you got out of the car, you smelled what was going on in the abattoir, which was not fun. Good smell, yeah. Right. And then you'd walk up the stairs, and as you walked up the stairs, you'd meet the smells coming from the restaurant. Mm. So you'd leave behind that, that sort of, you know, the, the reality of what happens when you chicken. make food. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, particularly if you, if you slaughter animals. Smells are hugely important. Yeah. And, and since COVID came in, and, and it had this... This thing about losing yeah, your sense right. of smell and taste. Can you imagine? I have been, I've never taken better care of myself. Mm -hmm. I, I won't go near anyone who has COVID because yeah. if I lose my sense of smell and taste, I don't know what I'm going to well, do. Well, then you're, you're, the joy of cooking is... It's gone. Is, it's gone. The joy yeah. of many things, actually. Uh, <laughs> speaking of joy of cooking, I don't, I, I'm, I'm segueing because I remember things from reading your book. What did you have with Julia Child for uh, lunch? Well, we had this incredible experience. Our son Max was in a camp in Vermont. Mm -hmm. This is when we. This is later when we were on LA Law, so we were famous. So that's a whole. That's a whole different thing. And we went on a, a visiting day, which is a horror for the for the parents. It's a horror for the children. It's a very uncomfortable day, and then you have to say goodbye. And so we're there for the visiting day. And there's this other couple whose daughter is a friend of our son's. They're about, what, eight years old, nine years old. And so this couple, we're talking to them, and I say to him, oh, what do you do? And they know who we are. And I say, well, what do you do? And he said, I'm a, a, a producer of Julia Child's cooking show. Oh, wow, that's great. I love to cook, and then this and that, and this and that. And he said, and if ever, here, let me give you my card, because if ever you want to come and, uh, on a day that we're shooting right. uh, in her house in, in Cambridge, um, I, I can arrange that. And I said, um, how about tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, I put him on the spot. Right. But he said, well, we're not shooting tomorrow, but it's a prep day, and the crew will be there, and we'll be kind of going through stuff. And I said, that, that sounds great, if, if it's okay. So we show up at Julia Child's house, and she's great, and uh, a guy from the crew had been fishing, and they brought these blue fish. And she said, wonderful, you know, we'll cook these blue fish, and <laughs> we'll all pitch in, and that's why I was dicing up tomatoes, and, and I'm cooking with Julia Child, you yeah. know, I'm so like in heaven. And she was, um, she was fantastic, and the bluefish came out, and she said, the thing about bluefish is you have to time the rigor mortis in fish. You know, you, if, if, you, you, if you cook them before rigor mortis sets in, that's fine, and if you cook them after rigor mortis is left, that's fine, but you can't cook a fish when it's in rigor mortis. <laughs> oh, no. Who knew? Oh, no. Who knew? Right. <laughs> she was a trip. And then the next night, we were invited to go out to dinner with her and some other people. And we went to this restaurant in Boston that had just opened. Um, a woman chef who was highly touted, supposed to be the best in town. And so we went to a restaurant with Julia Child, which is like going to church with the Pope. Yeah. And, and um, we all sit down, and they gave us the menus and everything. And when the waiter came over, she said, she said um, can I take your order? And Julia Child said, we're all having first this, this, and then this. Everybody. We're all, every, that's what everyone will have. Um, well. Said, okay. That's okay, and, and we had it, and it was all very good. And right. someone said to her after dinner, why did you order the same thing for everybody? And she said, I'm sick and tired of people sharing my food. <laughs> and if we, 
if we all had the same thing, then we could all just happily eat our own dinner without somebody reaching over and <laughs> sticking their fork in it, you know. So, I agree with that. <laughs> Speaking of eating out, did I, you I eat? rarely get yeah. the did, opportunity did you, to did do you my Julia out? Child, so <laughs> right. very happy to be able to do that. <laughs> did you eat out when you were a kid? Did your family eat out? Occasionally. You know, we were not wealthy people at all. Uh, and Chinese uh, food was... Um, there was a Chinese restaurant in our neighborhood, which was suburban Baltimore. Um, and it was called the Lotus Inn. Mm, a lot of those. A, yeah, a lot of those. And it had a big neon sign, and it was shiny and bright, modern, everything. It had its own parking lot. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we would go there. And that was the first Chinese food I had ever tasted. And, you know, it was, it was okay. My, my brother, I, I was young. I was a kid. And, you know, my brother and I would eat the, the little fried whatever, wontons, wontons. Uh, on, with mustard and duck sauce. Yeah. And then, you know, eat what we were forced to eat. And the food, uh, looking back on it, was, was, was wretched. Not, yeah, wretched. Right. It was cornstarch and filled with ground. Right. Then there was this other place. Both my parents worked in this department store in downtown Baltimore. And twice a year, my brother and I would get on a bus and go down to the store and go to the boys' department because there was a, a big sale. Twice a year, there was a huge sale. Plus, my parents got an employee discount. And we would buy clothes for the year. You know. And afterward, we would uh, leave the store with all the employees, which kind of was neat. And there was a night watchman and everything. Knew everybody's name. And then we walked up the street. And we're in downtown. And around the corner and up these creaky, dark stairs. Mm. And it looked very disreputable. Sketchy. Very sketchy. And the smells that were coming from upstairs were like nothing I had ever smelled in my life. Mm -hmm. This place was called Mi Jean Lo. So not and when we got to the top, we realized that there was no, we were the only non-Chinese people in this restaurant. Families and people and couples and things, all Chinese yep. people. And by, we're standing there waiting to get a table and this whole fish covered with all kinds of vegetables in this sauce and everything comes by and what's that and you know one smell after the other and it was the best it's, i think it's still the best chinese food i've ever had yeah yeah and i realized a very very two two very important lessons if a place is disreputable looking but there's a good smell coming from it yep go to that place that's the first one and the second one was that Chinese people make much better food for Chinese people than they do for white people. That's right. My father always said, this was one of the lessons I learned from my dad, he said, when you walk into a restaurant, if it's an ethnic restaurant, if there are people of that ethnicity in the restaurant, then eat there. Yeah. If they're not, Absolutely. get out. Absolutely. And it makes perfect sense. Of course. Um, so... Because, uh, you know, my family business was, was the restaurant business. Not just my, my father, but my grandpa, whole family. My grandfathers, uh, everybody, you know, all the families worked in the restaurants. So there was a lore that was always passed down, and that was part of the and lore. And you broke the chain, didn't you? I did what? You broke the chain. You became an actor. That's right, yeah. Much to my father's chagrin, I must say. Um, so w w was there anything different about the family dynamic when you went out? as opposed to when you ate at home? Yeah, my parents were nicer to each other. Really? Yeah, because they were in public. Mm. Yeah. My mom was rough on my dad. And yeah. it was a you know, huge problem. My mom was, my mom was difficult. And, uh, but out, she was overtly nice to Right. Me. And I, even though it was bad acting, yeah. I accepted it. You, you, it was nice to see them getting along. You bought it. Well, but you, you also talked to me one time, and it's also sketchily in the book, about a, an amazing crab dinner <laughs> Oh, yeah. at some friends that yeah. was very revealing about your parents. Yeah. So, so 
the, uh, my dad was in the fur department. He was the buyer of the fur department at the Hochul Cone department store in Baltimore. And his Cracker Jack salesperson was Lil Haas, who was a fabulous, tall, sexy redhead. And um, she was great. She was from Germantown in Baltimore. She was German, and her husband, Phil, was German. Their name was Haas. Her husband, Phil, worked at Bethlehem Steel and uh, was the only person I had ever met who wore a hard hat to work. Mm. You know, this, we didn't know right. those kind of people. We right. were in northwest Jewish Baltimore. And like middle class. Middle class. And, but they, they were, I think, they're among the greatest people I've ever known. And we got invited, they had a cabin on this little tributary that led out into the Chesapeake Bay. And we went down there for an overnight trip. And we were dressed like little Lord Fauntleroy. My mother had, you know, we had matching leisure suits and things like that, you know. And Phil Haas looked at us and said, Helen. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta do something here. <laughs> These boys can't have any fun. And then in the afternoon, he asked us if we wanted to go out on a boat with him. And I'd never been on a boat. And he had this, you know, open, open boat with an right. outboard motor. And he was, we were going to go out and check the crab pots. He had a line of crab pots out in the Chesapeake Bay. And you're how old here? Nine or ten. Mm. And my brother is four years older. And we, we look at, and so he says, well, now roll up those pants, roll up those pants, because this is a messy job. And, and we, I looked at the boat, and, and he said, now, Mike, you're going to be the bailer. And he gave me a can. And he said, you'll bail the water out, because some there's a little leak in the boat. And I'm, <laughs> 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 and I think this. This is the Titanic. I'm going down. You know, this is the end of my life. So, so we get, so we get right in the boat, and I start bailing, bailing. He said, "No, no." He said, "Let's wait until we get out of water somewhere." Right. I was throwing all the, the 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 water on the land. Anyway, so we get out, and we and a, a crab pot is is a cage like this big, big thing, and he had a string of 25 or 30 of them. And we would haul it up, and then he took the top off and shook the crabs out into the boat. So we shared the boat with mm -hmm. the crabs. And then we would throw out the small ones and the females uh, and keep what they call the number one jimmies. Mm -hmm. and the number one jimmy is what you want to eat. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a big, full, heavy, right. succulent. Right, mature. Mature crab. So we did this on, you know, it was almost getting dark by the time we got back, and we had a ton of crabs. And uh, Phil and his son-in-law started to cook the crabs. Dinner didn't get started until about 10 or 10.30, which was past my bedtime already. Right. And uh, they had a, a, a big you know, pot, what do you call that, a, not a vat, but a, mm -hmm. anyway this tall that they put on the stove and they, they put uh, 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 a little thing to, to uh, separate the crabs from, they put beer and oh, yeah. malt, vinegar, and Old Bay seasoning, and they put this rack in there, and then layered, put layers of crabs in, and at each layer they would throw, put, in, the old throw in Old Bay, plus a little cayenne to make them a little hotter, mm -hmm. and so it was layer, 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 They'd put a top on it and put a, a cement block on the top of the cap, on, on top of the... So they wouldn't escape? So they wouldn't escape. Because uh, once they turned the, the heat on, the right. crabs... Watch out. Yeah. <laughs> right. Those mature crabs. Yeah. <laughs> and they were tough. Mm -hmm. Anyway, when the, 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 then and every, we all set the table, which is newspaper. So you had the Sunday newspaper, right. you had two versions of the Sunday newspaper to cover this table with layer after layer of newspaper. Everybody had a mallet, mm -hmm. you know, and some people had a little knife to get, you know, artistic about you know, mm -hmm. doing the whole thing. But I just used my fingers. And we started eating crabs. 
one pot after the other. Oh. And it, it, you know, eating crab is a slow process because you're working. You have to yeah. get the meat out. I used to go to a crab restaurant in New York City on 72nd Street. Oh, yeah. Crab House? Yeah, it was called... Yeah, I remember I that called, place. Anyway, and go ahead. Th those were much smaller crabs that yes, we were right. talking about here. And um, I noticed, you know, and it also had to do with Lil and Phil, our, our hosts. My parents relaxed in front of them. And, and they were drinking beer. Everybody was drinking beer. It was the first taste of beer I ever had because mm -hmm. Phil would sneak over and give my brother and I a little bit of beer to cut the pepper, mm -hmm. you know, that was in our mouth. The pepper was everywhere. It was, you know, on your arms, up to your shoulders because, you know, you were eating. It was an orgiastic kind of right. eating. And they were, you know, they were fantastic. It was way past my bedtime. I'm looking at my mother and father, and they're laughing together and having and flirting with each other yeah. and holding each other. And, 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 and I never, I've never seen them before or since that happy with each mm -hmm. other and happy to be with each other. Right. So that, that was a big memory. Around 2, 3 in the morning, Lil starts a pot of coffee and then cooks bacon and eggs. And that's breakfast for the fishermen mm -hmm. who are going to go out at dawn, including mm -hmm. us, yeah. and fish. Uh, and that was perhaps the greatest meal I've ever eaten. Wow. I mean, it was... And, and but it, it goes back to something you were talking about earlier, about that, that thing that happens when you're cooking. Pleasure partners. Pleasure partners, yeah, that's right. And, and how it infected your parents. Not only the food, but also those people. Yes. Those two people. Those two people. Those generous, extraordinary people. Open. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful people. Ah, oh, boy. Uh, one other thing that I can't, we cannot uh, get by, and that is uh, a story that you told me once about your uncle, who was a jeweler. Oh, my uncle Benny. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, the fact that you worked with him. I did. For, I for him. For, for him. him. I worked for him as a stock boy, runner. I would. Uh, my most interesting job was, uh, he also did repairs on jewelry and watches and things. And I would run the jewelry to the repair shop, and there were various different, this for diamonds, this for watches, right. this for... And if, so it was a very responsible job. You could, these were expensive pieces. Where, was, where did you carry the, was it in a bag? Uh, no, I, I, I carried, I was told to carry it in my pocket with my hand in my pocket. And, and he checked your pockets, right? Yes, he checked my pockets every to, day. To make sure there weren't any holes in your pocket. Yeah. And that's right. <laughs> and and uh, my other job was to get lunch for the salesmen so that they never had to leave the floor, so mm -hmm. they could always make a sale you know, right. throughout the day. And on the corner was Klein's Pool Hall, again, up a creaky stairway to the second floor. And this was an old, fabulous Baltimore tradition pool hall filled with businessmen, lawyers, and doctors, the burgers of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And they would have their lunch there, and there was a steam table with the best brisket I have ever tasted. Boiled, but not, not boiled, but simmered, slowly simmered. And if you ordered a sandwich, they would hand cut the rye bread thick, slather the mustard on, then with a fork, bring up the brisket, Slice it, still steaming, onto the sandwich. Made to order. Made to order. So I ordered all the sandwiches for the guys, and then I ordered one for myself, mm -hmm. which I had right there, right when it came out, mm -hmm. right when he sliced them. So I had the real thing, and the salesman, they got it cold. But <laughs> that's the way it is. Yeah, well, that's kind of, it's kind of the story of... of Delivery food, in a way. I, I'm against it. Yeah. I'm against it. I mean, you know, we, we all did a lot of it, right, during COVID. Ordering Which reminded in. me why I'm against it. Yeah. Because food, when, when food is cooked, just at the moment that it's cooked, that's food. And then, at the other end, after dinner, and you start to scrape the plates, that's garbage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these two ends. I, I learned this Take out food is somewhere in between those. Two. Right. And also, you, you and I have had a conversation about doneness 
of food. And, and uh, you guys very generously invited me over to dinner, the poor lost bachelor when, when Joanna, my wife, was We were was very in. sad for you. Yes, I know, I know. And you brought me in from the cold or from the Jeez. lukewarm, whatever it was. <laughs> and uh, you made swordfish that night mm -hmm. uh, because Joanna was out of town and you, you wanted to take mercy on this I didn't. poor lonely I didn't. man. And one of the things that impressed still me... still makes me sad to think of it. I, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that impressed me most was that the way you, you prepared swordfish that night. I remember it vividly because it was delicious, and I'm not a big fan of swordfish. And it was about the perfect moment to serve the, the particular kind of food for whatever it is you're cooking. Mm -hmm. And that moment is... When it's ready. <laughs> but but how do how do, how do you know it's ready? Oh well, it's it's touch. Touch. It's always touch. Yeah, that's the and, and also to take it off just before it's before done. Before and let it finish in, in its own heat. In right. its own heat. S swordfish uh, rare is is horrendous. I mean, unlike tuna, which is great rare, and, mm -hmm. uh, other, you know, right. salmon. Yeah. But swordfish is not good rare, or or even medium rare. Swordfish has to be just done through. And the second it's done through, eat it. Right. Yeah, and if it goes over, it's dry. I learned the touch thing from my son, who's a trained chef, and he, he always... Yeah. That's it. And it works for meat, it works for fish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other thing I want to talk about, well, that's actually a couple... And sex as well. And what? And sex. Yeah. The touch. Right. <laughs> I just wanted to get that in. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and that is, you, you, you told me a wonderful story about when you were in high school uh, and uh, your drama teacher, or you're the English teacher English who was teacher. the drama teacher. In those days when we were in school, Mike and I, the English teacher was almost always the drama always, teacher. Yeah. yeah, there was no specific person. Yeah, this and, was, yeah. and you were going to New York City, and what happened? Jerry Levin was his name. He was um, my freshman high school English teacher, um, and he changed my life. He introduced me to Shakespeare. He introduced me to acting, really, mm. and um, poetry. And he was just fantastic. And he was, he was a man about town. He was also the head of the folk singing club at school. And uh, he played banjo and had this gorgeous German girlfriend. He was great. And Jerry was like, oh. And um, a couple of years later, when I'm ready to graduate, high school, I was a terrible student, terrible student. And I wasn't even recommended for college by my high school. And, but I wanted to go to drama school. And uh, there was an audition in New York to go to Carnegie Institute of Technology, right. which was among the two or three mm, yeah, best. Yeah, there were like two schools, yeah. Yale and Carnegie Tech, and yeah. the school I went to, Catholic U. Catholic U is a great, yeah. great drama right. school. So, he, Jerry helped me pick the, my two, I had to do a, a sort of, uh, I had to do, you know, a, a sort of comic one and a serious one. And he helped me pick the monologues and watched me do it a couple of times. And then um, he went up with me. And uh, the night before the audition, we went down to the village to a folk club. And that night we went to visit a friend of his, who, a, an army buddy of his, who lived in Brooklyn. And his army friend's mother made famous potato pancakes. Oh. Latkes. And we went, he called them, Jerry always called them PKs. I don't know why PKs, because there's no K. No. But he, he uh, said, these are the best PKs you'll ever have. And they were, they were damn good. And next day I did my audition. And I got into school. I got into school and I was off and running, which was... Uh, was, so it that, the, was it the PKs? I, th I liked it. Liked, they gave me some ballast. Right, right. Yeah. Did you keep the recipe? Do you use it? I did have that recipe. I did have that recipe, but I found a better one. I just so happen... I know you do. <laughs> ...to have the recipe that Michael uses, because we've discussed this. This is a cookbook called The New York Cookbook by Molly O'Neill, and you have to hear... This recipe. This is, this is a good recipe. Yeah. Okay. This is a recipe for latkes, potato pancakes, by a man, not a, not a professional chef, 
a journalist whose name is David the Latke King Firestone. And he, um, he has, and she has his recipe in here. And he, um, number one uh, direction is pick up the potatoes and admire their heft, their pure starchiness. So then he, he's talking about this and this, and we get down here. And then he says, when the potatoes are shredded, put them into a colander over a large bowl. Dump in the onion bits and mix everything around with your hands, squeezing the potato moisture out as you work. Let the mixture drip for a few minutes while you put on a recording of Kitty Carlisle singing, Beat Out That Rhythm on a Drum. <laughs> now, that is the best recipe direction I have ever read in my life. The Latke King. The Latke He's David the King. The Latke King. <laughs> That's right. Uh, 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 I would be remiss if I didn't uh, return to your childhood and uh, ask you about uh, what Passover was like, because I know it was a f at times fraught. It was, it was fraught. It, I, I never much liked the holiday, even as a child. Big, big family thing, round table, so half the people you don't like, you know. Uncle so and so, or this one who pinches, you know. Or I had an uncle who tickled. <laughs> I had lots of aunts who, who pinched. And pinch. Oh, good pinch. Yeah. Hey, you're such a nice boy. Right. But, you know, okay, that was a bit. The, the food was bad because a, a lot of the food, it's a ritual dinner. And the ritual is to remember what it was like to be slaves in Egypt. And I'll tell you, the, the slaves in Egypt did not eat well. So we're eating things that remind us of punishing ourselves, you know, and, and, and displeasing ourselves to remember what we were back in the land of Egypt. So it was never a fun. Bitter herbs. Yes. Bitter herbs. Yeah. Does that sound like something you want to eat, bitter herbs? Mm. And there was, a, there was a dish, I can't remember what they called it, but it was a hard boiled egg, usually far over boiled, you know, like a rock egg, chopped up in salt water. I mean, who thought of that? Yeah. <laughs> Pharaoh, I think. I Pharaoh did, right. <laughs> but there was this one, uh, one Passover that um, my mother and her two sisters were in the kitchen days before, and they never got along. And it was like the three witches in Macbeth, you know, they were stirring the pot, making gefilte fish, which is okay when it's done. It's not my favorite dish even, you know, when it's done. But making it, the smells that were coming out of the kitchen were horrendous. And this, the energy that was coming out of the kitchen, the venom that was coming out of the kitchen. So start there. They didn't get along? They didn't get along. They, they, they were still vying for the love of their father who had been dead 40 years. Oh, day. boy. So we were at my Uncle Buster and Aunt Margie's house. They lived next door. They were my second parents, and I loved them dearly. And my Uncle Buster was going to do the ceremony, you know, the host of the evening. And he, had a, he, was, he, he could sing, and he, uh, he had a beautiful kind of husky tenor. And he started singing the prayers and the opening songs right. and things. And my mother came out of the kitchen and said, Buster, the kids can't understand that. Do it in English. And he joked with her. And I could see, because I knew my mother, I could see a storm was coming. And when my mother wanted to bring down a party, she could bring down a party. <laughs> right. Speaking of pressure cookers. And I, we, yeah. I saw it coming. And Aunt Margie, who was my mother's closest friend, she could see it coming. And uh, Buster, you know, argued with her a little bit, and she left the room. And Aunt Margie saying, "Bus, just do what she says," because, you know, he's, and he was laughing. And then she came back again, and with a tirade, do it in English. So he started singing the Hebrew songs with the English words, and it was funny. And everybody started cracking up, and my mother 
hit the ceiling and started screaming at him. And he started screaming back and calling her mad woman and crazy person. And then finally he took the prayer book and threw it down on the table and left the house, got in his car and went away, his house. And the meal was over. And uh, the meal never got finished. And um, I remember my brother and I sitting there thinking, you know, no one else has a mother that's crazy. Mm. Of course, everybody does, but we didn't know that. Then. Oh, I think we've all been through yeah. holiday meals that have been disastrous. And it was, it, yeah. was a painful, it was a painful night. And I, uh, so I, I've never enjoyed Passover since then. And I have wonderful friends who say, you'll love this Seder. We do a great Seder and you'll love it. And I say, thank you, but I won't. I won't. It's just... Do you think uh, in any way, and I'm, you know, sort of reaching here, but that this has anything to do with your, the, the joy that you uh, attempt often and succeed I, I brilliantly? Think, I, think, I think it does. At, I think, at cooking? I think my... my uh, my love of cooking has a great deal to do with properly completing that meal that mm. never was completed. Yeah. Well, these memories that we have, you know, they're very vivid for us, the feelings that they engender. And speaking of vivid, this has been such an illuminating conversation. <laughs> You're, you have such a lively, humane way of telling a story about your journey from your childhood through your adulthood with food. Thank you, Michael, for sharing this with all of us. Thank you, Ben. It was fun. Thank you. Michael Tucker. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>